Hi, I'm Ian Vasey with the Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation, and I'm the president and CEO. Ian Vasey. Okay, great. Um, first off, just before we get into the new Exxon ethane cracker uh, plant that's going to be built down there in Corpus Christi, talk about your um, uh, Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation for a minute or two, if you would. Okay, we are, Jason, we are a uh, not-for-profit corporation that's a uh, public-private partnership that is supported by both the business community here in the region and also um, uh, various government agencies and counties and cities. Um, the cities of Portland and, um, and Gregory and Corpus Christi um, are, are some of our partners. The Port of Corpus Christi is a partner. And also uh, Nueces County, Aransas County, and San Patricio County. So it's, we represent a three-county, uh, kind of the MSA for the Corpus Christi region. And we provide economic development services, which include business attraction, um, business retention and expansions. But we also do uh, national-level marketing, and um, uh, we maintain and provide data on uh, what's happening in the regional economy as well. So it's kind of a full-service economic development group that serves this metro area. Before we get into uh, the interview at hand, I wanted to ask you just if you heard the recent data I talked to gentleman from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas the other day about the oil and gas job report about how basically half of the jobs, if what was it, out of, whatever the amount of jobs were, one out of two were basically in Texas, meaning Texas added half the jobs in the oil and gas industry. Are you seeing that down in uh, your neck of the woods that um, the oil and gas industry are? So, so we've, we've seen really, if you think about it in the last five or six years, so 2000. 10, 11, you, we started getting into the kind of the shale revolution where directional drilling and micro seismology really started changing how companies um, were, were able to, to extract oil and gas out of the South Texas uh, strata. So what we saw is, is uh, wells becoming much more efficient. Um, micro seismology meaning that there hasn't really been in the last couple of years dry wells drilled. It used to be that you just drill vertically and have to move wells around. Now you've got these wells that go, um, pipes that essentially go out in directional drills that go out about a mile or two miles even in each direction. Now, what does that mean? We saw oil prices uh, maintained, um, kind of building up through I, th I suppose a high point in the in the 2014 area. Um, in fact, right around Thanksgiving, uh, 2014, there was uh, oil prices were north of 105, 108 dollars a barrel. And what happened is OPEC really maintained met right around that Thanksgiving time in 2014, and they maintained production levels at uh, you know world production level in the 95 million barrels a day kind of kind of region worldwide. And so we started to see a slide in employment, and rig counts got cut back. So we ended up with, um, you know, kind of at a high point in the Eagleford, which is which is one of the one of the shale plays just uh, just upland from us right here in Corpus Christi. So we saw north of 400 wells at peak, and then it kind of fell to an early point of 2016, probably February 2016, of, of around 30-something wells. So we saw a huge amount of layoffs in that 2000, end of 2014. 15 was a start of the slide. 16 wasn't a great year. In fact, 16 was a very poor year for employment in the oil and gas sector. Now, since, we, since the, that kind of low point, it stabilized in, you know, kind of building back up in the second half of 2016, and now we're well over 100 rigs in the, in the Eagleford, and it's coming back very strongly. So, you know, 16 was a bad year for, for, for the oil and gas sector. 15 and 16 were both bad years. 17, we're starting to really see the um, unemployment rates. Actually, it's not even the unemployment rates that are changing because you're, you're, you're seeing job count have significantly increase in those sectors. So, boy, I, I know that's way more than a lot of folks wanted to hear, but, but so we saw that kind of the buildup in 2011, 12, 13, kind of 14 it peaked, 15 it kind of started going downhill, 16 was bad, and we're starting that, that recovery again. So we're starting to see a lot more jobs being created in the energy sector, especially in South Texas. Now let's talk about the uh, Exxon 
plant being built down in your neck of the woods. Um, is this is this something you, you guys lobbied for for a number of years? Did it just it, did it work out? I guess talked about the uh, origin of how this thing got to where it's going to be at. You know, let, let, let me talk about this. We, we, we see a lot of deals that you, you would be shocked at how often um, either a law firm or a site selection consultant or some other type of uh, consultant knocks on our door and says, we want, you know, we've got a client that's looking to build a, do a billion-plus-dollar investment. We're looking for 1,000 acres or what have you. You know, and we fill out RFPs, and sometimes you work these deals and they're never real. Um, and then so, you know, we got an RFP that came across the, our desk called and this code name Project Yosemite, which was a similar kind of deal to what I just described. And, you know, we filled it out and sent it back, and the, there was a law firm involved, and the, and the governor's office of economic development was involved. And they said, you know, we like your area, we like your labor analytics, we like your, like your logistics, we like your infrastructure from the deep water port and things like that, but we're, we're, that site just doesn't really work. So we went back and studied some more sites and submitted those. And, you know, we got back some more questions. You know, we love this area. And this is going on for, over the course of the best part of a year. Um, and, and, and we get, you know, to the point where they're saying more questions, more questions, alternative site, let's look at some things. And so we, we had a real estate consultant, a local guy working with us, and we had engineers. You know, when, when you get 100 questions on engineering and, you know, t- soil pipes and, you know, where are pipelines and what's flow and what, what amount of water can you provide, you know, all of those questions, we have to, you know, we really play economic development game a little bit different than we ever did 20-something years ago. You know, we, we are very technical driven. There's a lot of engineering and a lot of financial analysis that goes into it. And so I'm sitting in one of my, my team's offices, and we, we basically had to get to a point where we're spending quite a bit of money on engineering feasibility with a company that we didn't know who it was. So um, we pushed back on the, on the law firm that was involved, and they said, you know, it's a very real client. And I said, look, I'm not willing to spend another $10,000 on engineering if, you know, if we don't know who it is. It's probably not a real company. And so he sent over non-disclosure agreements, and in hindsight, I can talk about this, um, sent over non-disclosure agreements, which are about 20 pages long, meaning like you promise your firstborn child if it's, you know, if, if it's disclosed on this project, but the name's Exxon and SABIC, and SABIC being Saudi Arabian Basic Industries Corporation. So two giants were partnered on this deal. And, you know, things got very real after that. So we, we got into some, some major site selection, feasibility, engineering analysis. How do we build the infrastructure? How do we get heavy lift roads? How do we get the, the amount of power for, for a project like this? I'd say all told, it was, a, you know, somewhere between 18 months and two years worth of process that, that it took to, to get this deal to the point where it's at right now. So where is it at right now? Um, when, what are some of the timelines and milestones that uh, you guys are uh, trying to trying to accomplish? The, the information that that is in the public realm is that the the company has optioned a piece of property. Um, it's a partnership that that called Gulf Coast Growth Ventures, which is a partnership between Exxon and SABIC, but it's Exxon being the lead partner on this. Um, they've optioned a piece of property. They've filed um, for permits through, through TCEQ, which is the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Um, they'll go through probably that, that permitting process for a large-scale project is, you know, probably no less than nine months and more likely closer to 24 months. So it's so a one- to two-year kind of time frame to clear all the permits. And then, um, you know, should they clear all of those permits through both the, the state and federal uh, governments, um, we should see probably activity, we should see it nothing before probably the end of 2018 for moving dirt, potentially more likely 2019. And then it's probably about a four-year four year time frame to build facilities of this scale. So when you're talking about $10 billion investment, you don't wave a magic wand and something gets built overnight. It takes several years to build. And, uh, you know, they're going to have potentially, you know, as many as four to 5,000 construction workers on site at peak. So it's, it's going to be a several-year process to build these things. How about just a couple of the numbers, uh, four to 5,000 construction workers at its peak? How many employees are going to be uh, part full-time employees at the plant? And do you guys have any, like, uh, rough economic uh, impact numbers that either it's going to have before and after? 
Well, uh, you know, the companies are going to invest close to $10 billion. The numbers that they've committed to are about 640 uh, full-time uh, professional-level jobs, um, plus whatever, I think there's probably additional support and part-time and contract folks, but 640 full-time jobs. The, um, the sal- average salaries of, of those 640 is about $90,000 a year. Um, it'll create somewhere north of um, direct spending within this local market every year upon operations, somewhere north of $50 million in payroll. So if you think about, you know, kind of $50 million injection every year for the next, you know, 40, 50 years or even more of, uh, of payroll, it's a several, several billion dollar um, um, kind of by the time you have the multiplier effect going through uh, over a five-year period. So um, this is probably one of the largest uh, economic impact deals in uh, certainly on the Gulf Coast in recent memory. Hmm. Anything we left out? I'd like to give guests final word. Uh, anything that we need to reiterate? Anything that um, you think of is, should would be of interest to a capitalism, uh, energy, and gas audience out there? Yeah, you know, one of, one of the critical things that we are seeing is there's about five or six companies that are significantly investing in pipelines and distribution networks to bring both oil, crude oil, and, and natural gas and natural gas liquids in from the, the Permian Basin, the Eagleford Basin, down towards Corpus Christi. And one of the things we're hearing is that those companies are investing in infrastructure to bring product here because the port of Corpus Christi is, is a lot less congested than some of our other uh, ports that you might see at, say, Houston. Um, so we'll see a lot less uh, congestion. They're bringing product down. Natural gas liquids being a feedstock. So ethane is an example being a, um, a feedstock that goes into the plastics industry. Um, we're starting to see a lot of activity. We've got a lot of other companies that are, that are kicking the tires. I'd say there's probably another, probably another 10 um, major industrial projects that are kicking the tires on various cities from, I'm going to say, Brownsville all around the Gulf Coast to, say, you know, kind of New Orleans area. And, um, you know, we're, we're all actively competing for this. This is, this is kind of the next generation of the, of the uh, petrochemical manufacturing wave that we're seeing. That's amazing. You know, when you were talking, it kind of reminded me of up in the Bakken, there's the uh, Meridian Energy Group is building the Davis Refinery, the first greenfield full-on refinery in the last 50 years in the United States. And part of the process of uh, doing the story on that, um, we uncovered a study that was done in the state of Washington about refineries. And I can't remember the st- name of the study off the top of my head, but it basically said that for every job one of these refineries brings in, like the one you guys have building down there, the ethane cracker one by ExxonMobil, or the Davis refinery up in the Bakken by the Meridian Energy Group, it brings 12 jobs. So they're bringing 200 jobs to the Davis refinery. That's going to have a $2,400 or 2400 person impact out in a community where the town it's going in doesn't even have 2400 so some of the suburb areas are going to obviously grow in size but have have you guys gotten down to that you mentioned the 50 million dollars in salary and you started talking about some of the ripple effects but have you guys analyzed that yet or is that still a little bit too far in advance no we 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 do it's it's just one of those things that when you start talking about indirect and then you know there's the direct impact and there's the indirect impact which is the contractors the company and then there's the induced which is kind of the you know will you know the 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 company being the direct the contractors being the indirect and then you get in the induced being like the sandwich shop down the street those are very hard numbers you know, we do have calculations, we do, we, but we very much prefer to talk about the direct impact. Um, one of the other things that, that, that's actually really important, and, and we've, we've been able to put in all the agreements with, with the companies, is that they're giving preference to hiring local vendors and suppliers. Um, so if, a, if there's a company that's located here in, in one, of the, one of the counties here that wishes to become a supplier of everything from either welding services, moving dirt, um, operations, even janitorial, and the guy that makes the sandwiches that goes into, you know, to, to feed the crews, they're going to be trying to hire local companies. So we, we, we've really structured agreements. We've put a lot of thought into how do we make sure that local companies benefit from, from a major project locating in our area. Not, not, we spend 
a lot of time on that. It's going to be, you know, the, the, the direct and indirect benefit is probably going to be in the $2 billion range. Now, we don't use numbers like 12, you know, 12, you know, additional employees multiplier effect. We're very much more conservative than that. We're in the probably the three to four range. But still, if you get 650, 600, you know, 40 direct jobs, you're looking at, you know, you're looking at, you know, 3,000 jobs potentially, um, all told, directly supporting that. From a, an overall perspective, that means um, just this one project will move our um, employment numbers about one and a half, maybe as much as two percent across the entire metro area from one project. Well, those are good problems to have and uh, good numbers to uh, parse and splice out and everything like that. So, um, well, thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. Jason, I've enjoyed it, and uh, thank you to you and your uh, group for the good work you do.